Hello, everybody. How's everyone today? Good. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I, hello, I'm Avery Willis Hoffman. I'm the program director here at the Armory. Uh, welcome to our second session of the day. Um, and how many people were here in the first session? Wonderful, oh, fantastic. Okay, so we won't give the full spiel, um, but I'm so grateful to our partners, um, Roberta Uno at Art Change US and Damian Wetzel at um, the Aspen Institute uh, Arts Program, and we've been working very hard on putting this together, and so we're so pleased to uh, have you all here today. We're gonna have a wonderful session of panels and uh, performances uh, throughout the rest of the afternoon. So I thought we would start our session with a special reading, so if you will join me in welcoming Ahimsa. Sego, it's good to be here in Lenape territory. Um, when they asked me to do uh, one brief uh, poem opening for a session, this session really resonated for me as a writer and multimedia artist. So I was like, please, can I like open for them? Um, so I'm just going to read one poem. Repatriation. National Museum of the American Indian. Into the museum of our people, I take you through the, by the hand, through the exhibits. It means something to kiss you here. By the exhibit on native skateboarding and land surfing, I take your tongue into my mouth and you mine. We are protected. Our art and bodies for once protected. People need to go through security to get to us. Perhaps this is where we are most safe, behind glass. People can't say shit or there'll be consequences. You gonna say something to two queer native boys in a native museum? Who knew this is where our kissing should be? We come home at places the general public can't enter with weapons, past the electric wands and gates, security guards. You have to pay admission to see us. Perhaps they will bring offering, centuries in waiting, grand entry. Perhaps this is where queer powwows can occur, urban Indians can go, where we can make out have our 49er songs, imagine 1491. We sealed the deal with a kiss amidst other work of art. I take you before I make love to you. There is a pattern, processional, protocol for mating. I take you here, then we eat, then we will eat again. You so good against my tongue. You the one treasure I stole from the museum, repatriated, Nyawa. Thank you so much. Now I'll turn it over to Kalia and this fantastic panel that we have. Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's nice to get some feedback from the audience. This is great. Um, my name is Kalia Brooks Nelson, and I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this session that is entitled Visualizing Change. Um, we have a wonderful group of panelists with us today. Um, directly next to me is Jasmine Morell, Melissa Calderon, and Chanupa Hanska Luger at the end. Um, and today what we're going to be focusing on is thinking about the power of the visual arts to unearth hidden histories and um, explore societal change. So as you know, many of you know because you were at the earlier session, for those of you who don't know, we have a a condensed amount of time, and so we don't anticipate having any, any time for questions. Um, but I do encourage you, if you have really pressing questions, to write them down, to remember them, so that when you see us after session, we can keep the conversation that's generated here, we can keep it going and, and get to know you all more on a more sort of uh, interpersonal level. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and jump right in and um, I want to ask the panelists, so there's a really Im important quote from the legendary musician, singer, and songwriter Nina Simone, where, and I'm paraphrasing here, she, she talks about the artist's responsibility, um, where she sees it as the artist's duty to reflect the times. And so I want to open up this session uh, just by posing that to you. Uh, uh, what do you see, each of you, um, as your responsibility as the artist? How would you respond to um, a statement like that that was made in the 1960s within our current cultural context? 
Jasmine, should we start with you? Oh, goodness, okay. Since you're the closest. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the first thing I can think about is that for me to be able to practice art or even go and study art, it was made from a community support out of complete love. You know, this Detroit woman, you know, um, I would not have been able to afford to go to study parts out of scholarship. And so um, every single thing that I, I do is really into also just honoring my ancestors and things that are before me that are part of where I am now. Like I, whatever I do is because of the paths that my ancestors have done and invisible bodies that have done or con contribute. So, um, and I can't help, I mean, we can't help as artists, I think that you're, you become extremely sensitive to what's, and have empathy for what is not only going on politically around um, the world, but also our kind of disconnect to um, living things, living beings, being able to communicate with people and community and beyond like machines. And, and so, um, so at the same time, I mean, Nina Simone is like, she's another sh Shiro, like this phenomenal woman. And I think that in order to stay sane, she had no choice but to sing what she couldn't necessarily explain to someone in terms of that oppression that not only her individual body was going through, but the collective bodies that made her, that went through. Thank you, and I encourage you all to, I mean, this is a conversational moment, so, you know, if you're moved to speak, by all means, Uh, hello, <laughs> Dokcha Maragua. Hello, my friends. Um, I like this opening for our conversation because for me, I don't know where my life ends and my art begins. I haven't, haven't created a good delineation between these two things. Um, and I encourage everybody else to recognize what is your art, you know? Um, I think we're limited to these ideas of what art making is, and now we, are, we have access to materials that we don't know how to describe that as art yet. But um, whatever you're doing out there, do it beautifully, you know? Um, it's laying bricks, if it's writing code, like do it beautiful, do it in an art way. And then in direct response to the, the statement you made, we have no choice but to respond and be a voice for our times. Um, art is older than we are. Art is older than humans. Like before Homo sapien, we were cutting rocks to look like beautiful uh, uh, tools. And that is, uh, you know, I think a, a process of art making. And I, and I think about the knife, for instance, or like a hand axe that was chiseled, you know, chiseled out by a different species than us. And some of them functioned and they were designed for cutting up meat and sharing. Um, our agency turned them into weapons. Our agency turn, you know, transformed this idea. But I feel like the creation itself is perfect. And I don't know how to, um, I don't know how to separate that from, I don't know how to separate art from life, you know? Um, and, I, and I encourage people to experience the world in that same fashion. Make your life beautiful, you know? Um, and respond to our times. Melissa? I would definitely, I definitely agree with you. My, my art and my life are, they're interchangeable. And I really enjoy making work like that. And one of the things I, I've, um, one, of the one of the parts of my practice is to, is almost a three part uh, process, which is to bring uh, a historical memory, my own personal memory, and then coupling those things with what is happening in the world right now. Because I do believe that those three things make up everybody's um, perspective of the world. It's what came before, what you're dealing with now, and sort of who you are as a person. So when I think about um, make work 
for right now. It's always, for me, even though as I began as an artist, I'm a self-taught artist, self-taught <laughs> from the Bronx. Um, I've had to learn how to correct that word and very many others just so I can speak in public. I mean, it's sort of that feeling, but um, I really, I began making work because I just, I was around a community of, of other artists and I was in the South Bronx and I was trying to find my voice and my voice was the things that were happening around me and I just started making work in that sense and I started to incorporate parts of my life that were from my grandmother and my grandfather and, and sort of creating this voice of my own that I felt was very similar to other voices, you know, things that were um, important and I found the topics, not so much the materials and how I made, because I really didn't care what I made it in as long as the idea was there for me and I would work in tissues or I would work in embroidering on wood and I would sort of look into mining data for, uh, for new projects and it was really important for me to just make sure that the work that I was making was in the voice right now. Uh, just a one example of this feeling, this making work of right now, I had a studio in the South Bronx across the way from the Bronx Housing Court. And every day when I would go to my studio, I would step out of that train and I would see that long housing court line of people fighting for their homes. And I was on that line once. I was there fighting for my house when I lost my job. And I, it was visceral to see people there and knowing that I was there. And I had lost my battle. I had to leave my place. But it led me to making a piece that I, that's entitled The Bronx Housing Court Monster, where I made a sort of an Attack of the Killer Tomatoes style uh, monster in embroidery. Because to me, as, as I would look out my window from my studio and I would see that very particular architecture of the housing court that looked like an eyeball, sort of the cyclops looking at you as you're sort of looking around, it, I felt like that was my everyday life, going to that studio, that eye was looking at me. It was the eye that was in the community. And so I, I wanted to always continue to make work that I felt like if I put this on the fence right outside my studio, that the community is gonna get it because it, I'm a part of this community and I do live in that community. So it was, it's continually important for me to continue to talk about the stuff that matters to me to me personally and to, to where I am in, in the world and, and right now that's in the South Bronx. Thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many artists are in the room? If you could just raise your hand. Okay, uh, curators, arts enthusiasts. That's what I uh, <laughs> Cultural producers. Okay, if you haven't raised your hand, just shout out what you identify with as a maker. If you, huh? A critic. A critic. Oh, writers, okay, okay. Um, huh? Lender? Funder. Funder, excellent, excellent. Okay, just so that we, we know who is in the room with us as we're speaking, we know um, what, what and who our community is comprised of in this moment. Um, so, I'm really interested to know what your visual strategies are um, and, and really engaging your audience to think critically about certain political or, or social issues. And I, I, I think this is an opportunity also to, you know, talk a little bit about your individual practice in responding to this, but, um, you know, we had a uh, brief conversations before this panel started, just you know, getting to know each other as a panel, and you know, we, we touched on this idea of, um, you know, how do you get people to think in new ways? How uh, does how is your work an opportunity to shift a bit um, a person's perspective? So, if each of you could just talk a little bit about the strategies that you use as artists to to do that. Do you mind if I go? I, so I just did a workshop here. That is one of my strategies. Um, I had a workshop where we were building ceramic beads to represent uh, missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada. But primarily what I'm trying to do is take data, which our, our society right now seems to be very interested in data and data gathering. 
Um, I'm interested in how data gathering run through machines actually helps facilitate the communities that this data is gathered from. Um, but primarily, I'm interested in how we, as a living thing, um, and a part of that living th thing union, relate to data. Um, and in particular, this project that I'm working on, I'm producing, or we are producing, 4,000 plus beads um, for a large beaded portrait. Um, for me, I wanted, I, I started this project by doing it myself, sitting in my studio, sitting in the tiny little island that is my studio with the feedback loop of everything that I'm thinking and then feeling really proud of myself for thinking these sorts of things. Um, but then being like, oh, that's, this is the art. Like the object, this is a byproduct of something beautiful. The making portion is, is the art. And so I was like, how can I share that? How can I share this experience? And how, how is that making me relate to this idea of data? So I'm sitting in my studio rolling ceramic beads and, um, and I'm thinking, you know, there's 4,000 recorded in Canada missing and murdered indigenous women. And I'm thinking to myself, this is already too many. This is enough. And I'm, and I'm saying this over and over as I'm rolling these beads. And then I realized that that's, that's the conversation. You know, the object gets to go into an institution and gets to sit in a space and people get to relate to it and relate to those numbers, not as 4,000, but as 4,000 individual beads hand-rolled by people, you know, um, to engage with that space. And I don't know, this is some of the projects, I've, I've been moving more towards my practice, falling into that space where I share the process of production um, with society and using social media, once again, as like a, a through for, for this engagement and trying to make things simple so that if you're three or 93, you can do this, you know, um, and really embed what the conversation is, what the conversation that the final project is going to engage with, try to get you to be activated and active within whatever issue this is with your body, so that your body has muscle memory of what it takes to really engage versus liking and sharing and imagery and stuff like that. Um, so that's like a direct relation. And, and it's really in response to my practice of making art, which you know, I always saw that the object sat in a space and could talk without me there, and that was cool. But I think the making and the participatory aspect has been profoundly uh, uh, helpful with getting out these ideas. What kind of conversations are generated through that participatory aspect? I, I, I couldn't know. I couldn't know. Because it's open sourced, because small groups around the country are producing these beads themselves, I don't know what the conversation is that happens right there. All I could do is produce a narrative and a, and a, and a way to make um, that engages them. And I don't know if it coming through me is beneficial for the whole. You know, I don't want to bottleneck this experience and I want people to have how they relate to it be genuine through their filter and their communities. I would say, um, in particular, with the mortal uterus, is that I'm really a trickster. I, I really um, try to seduce the audience to come, 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 <laughs> you know? And then once they get there, then they're, you know, you're, you're kind of confused. They're like, wait, this is kind of dark. This is, and I wanted to also play, well, basically, the mortal uterus, um, it, it was inspired from actually extremely painful dealing with fibroids and 10 years ago and just doing the research and just finding um, being isolated and seeing that this was like a huge epidemic for african-american women and and how um, the medical industry uses this to um, make money in terms of not really healing the women and really and then from there um, these five, I started working, I discovered um, Henrietta Lacks' story, and I started collaborating with medical doctors that were um, working with cancer, actually growing her cells into these cancerous tumors and di seeing different types of, of tum I mean, um, tumors and things like that. So the piece came out of this impossible question of like, how can I, um, how can some something really amazing or not amazing some something amazing come out of a poison 
you know, or how, how can, um, and I, how can I transform kind of like this history of like the black body that's on film at the time, I use all these VHS films and transform it into something that is um, like kind of epic in a way. And so in the process of making this gigantic installation that took over 10 years, I collaborated with different weavers, some indigenous weavers of Guatemala. We swapped things. They said, you know, they needed some things. I said, hey, I need to learn those techniques. Can you show me? So, and I swapped with, you know, Dutch weavers and, and just people who didn't know how to weave. It was like, I just, I know how to braid. So I was like, okay, that's cool. So um, the installation grew, you know, to about 40 feet and it kind of changes and stuff and became like this um, interactive space for um, my favorite, you know, um, performance artists to just do things that I didn't know. And so, um, but yeah, the, everything really came out of this kind of miracle of like the mortal cell, which is kind of like this despicable thing of cancer. And then um, out of this cancer tumor of her uterus, you know, millions of lives have been saved because of the vaccinations and the medication that came out of this woman that no one gave even permission to take parts of her body from. So. Um, Um, if I wasn't an artist, I would have been a history professor because I really love history and it's, I used to just read my history books cover to cover in high school, just sort of grab them, read them all the way through and it was something that I really fell in love with and when I started thinking about my work and how I would make my work and you know, at the very beginning of being a new artist, you're still trying to find your way and figure out what, how you want to say things. And I found, uh, as I was sort of mining new ways to sort of discuss the work that I wanted to make, um, I was very lucky to have an exhibition at um, Hunter College, and it was in response to the Center for Puerto Rican Studies and their collection uh, in regards to labor. And I started to research and sort of dive into the El Centro and, and what they've done. And, I remember as a child, me and my grandma would make Cabbage Patch Kid clothes and sell them on the schoolyard and I would make half the money from it and that was my allowance. And this was something I would sit at her feet as she was in her sewing machine, sewing as she would. And it, this was something that she did in the 1940s and 50s. She was a seamstress in the Lower East Side as very many uh, Puerto Rican women who were coming from the island during the Great Migration were uh, put right into seamstress or uh, textile factories and it was something that was a part of her and it was a part of me and I started sort of going through my my history and, and realizing that I was I loved to sew and I loved the the idea of this permanence that was very very uh, sacred and very simple and how could I make this into something a, a, a larger idea yes I love to sew on canvas and everything but I wanted to make it more permanent I wanted to sort of equate sewing and embeddedness because very much uh, the things and the, the ideas that I had were very much uh, in the discussion of how they were embedded in society or how uh, subconsciously or consciously you were uh, a part of this. And I started embroidering on wood, which was a hell of a thing to do, uh, but I really enjoyed doing it and it was, it, it is, it's still going, it's, it's still a great process. But what I was hoping to do was sort of abstract these maps and create these, uh, one of the series I have is called The Arctic Meltdown and it's literally eight pieces from 1979 to 2035 of the Arctic ice extent melting all the way through to absolutely nothing in 2035. And I had cut these patterns out and I, I popped holes and drilled a bunch of holes and sewed the thread right into the wood to create these pieces. And you don't know exactly what they are in the beginning. And that was sort of the idea. Like I loved geography and I loved sort of this history and yet there's this sadness to the work I was making, whether it was about the Arctic ice or um, 
I had created a piece of the Bronx River where I, embro I embroidered into construction plywood. And the difficulty of making those pieces were definitely a part of this because I thought about this, this very long 12 foot Bronx River embroidered on construction plywood and I thought about the people who, including myself growing up near the Bronx River and it being this disgusting, waterway that was not clean, that was, you know, just, you never wanted to go near it. And during the last 20 years or so, the Bronx River Alliance and, and very many nonprofits have cleaned it up and made it this beautiful place. And that took lots of hard work. It took the work of the community. It took the work of the people who just were tired of seeing their river that way and cleaning it up and, and going for funding and, and all of those wonderful things. And as I sat there and sewed into that wood for what felt like months, um, I was remembering that this, this is part of, I'm, I'm hoping that I could capture the struggle of the people who made this river look beautiful again. And I had, when I displayed the piece, I was very happy that the community really loved seeing it because it was this very abstract, it's just sort of this blue line in, in, in the construction plywood, but yet this was a river that was never blue and is now has fish and a fish ladder and is doing so wonderful. And, you know, I wanted to honor this part of the Bronx, you know, that was revitalized. And, you know, not all, we, we talk about, I'm sure, gentrification and we talk about those things and not all revitalization is is bad. And of, of course we know that, but the Bronx River was one of these beautiful things that, you know, was able to come back from the dead very much like um, a lot of parts of the Bronx that ran along the river. Now you have bike paths and, and it's, just, it's just this beautiful place to be. And I really hope to continue that um, my embroidered uh, wood pieces are, are continually talking about places and embeddedness and, and really in engaging people to want to say, well, why this, why this material? And hopefully understand that the process is a part of the the whole concept of, of the work. It's really wonderful to hear each of you, you know, elaborate a bit on the kind of practice that you have and the kind of work that you make. Um, you each have um, an aspect of the participatory that's a part of your practice. And as Chanupa was saying, is just as important, and in lots of cases, even more important than the physical object or the finished piece. And so, I, just building off that, I want to hear you speak to um, what your relationship to the institution of art is like because you have this discursive elements to your practice and because you're dealing with histories and you're dealing with politics and you're uh, you know, dealing with uh, you know, embedded issues within communities. What is your relationship like to the institution? The institution of art or any other institutions that intersect with that because of the kind of practice that you have? I mean, honestly, right now, um, I'm, I'm just always asking myself, who is the audience? Who is the really the most important audience? Because I feel like in certain institutions, whether even though it creates this kind of these platforms or status when you are accepted into art and museums or um, universities and things like that, but for me, as a practicing artist and as an evolving artist, that I realized that there are so many other hidden treasures to validate. Um, success outside of traditional institutions. And so that interaction with the audience, even not only making it and thinking conceptually of how to create projects that expands the audience outside of um, traditional, like, um, you know, art studies. I'm just not really interested anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm just not. I'm just, I'm so many fascinating projects that are happening are not on Instagram. They're not really being documented. And at, and at the same time, that's why it is really important to archive. And I, and I am always questioning that because we don't really archive these like gems and they're kind of just erased out of like art history and things like that. But as an artist, I'm just trying 
to survive and trying to really um, collaborate with these multiple communities that are, to me, so special in my, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know if, that, if I answered the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I come from a marginalized group of people, and I am incredibly privileged being a heteronormative male. And with that incredible privilege, I try to uh, um, use it not for my own benefit. So how can I create voice for, and opportunities for folks who I think, you know, really hold these spaces, you know, and, and need to be shared within these spaces. So as far as engaging with institutions, I get invited to the table, you know, I get invited to sit at the table for this moment of, um, you know, diversity for their table, you know, and the threat that I've engaged with at these tables is that, you know, act accordingly or else we're not inviting you back, you know, <sighs> they ain't going to invite me back. Like, they ain't gonna invite anybody back who's a part of that margin and holding that diversity seat. And so I'm like, well, okay, you brought me here. Let's see if I can pull this, you know, tablecloth out and see what happens, knowing that that threat is hollow, you know? It's a hollow threat. Um, I look at the institutions, I look at these places, and they're embedded with systemic problems, systemic societal problems. And so, as long as we as artists and as makers and as people in the margins who are invited to these places, as long as we keep showing up and be complacent and grateful that we're there um, and thankful and humble, like all of these things, these are core customary practices of indigenous people, you know? Like, I'm like, I gotta maintain those core practices, but they also undermine us, like, as a collective. Uni unified group, you know, um, as the people of the world, you know, um, and so I'm trying to figure out ways to, to, I guess, undermine my own career with with institutions, <laughs> in order to benefit future generations, you know. Um, I'm, I'm pretty certain I am going to not see the beautiful and perfect world I would like to work towards, but I am going to die trying because this is the earth, everybody. Nobody gets out alive. <laughs> so that's, that's my relationship with them. <laughs> right. Um, similar to you, you know, whenever I get invited to the table, I'm, I'm there. Other than that, I, I pretty much, I'm in my community, you know. I, one of the things being a self-taught artist <laughs> is that you, uh, you know, the community I build is, is the community I have. You know, I didn't go to art school. I don't have an MFA. I didn't, I didn't usually those communities, they're, they're provided for you. And those institutions are sort of the, the place where you sort of have your in with other artists, with other people, with, you know, of artists of note. But, you know, I was, I was a Bronx girl that wanted to make work, and I was inspired by the artist community that was growing around me in the early 2000s, and that's, that's my institution. I, I've actually, uh, I have this shirt that says Mott Haven Art School, and I didn't wear it today because I was sick of wearing it, but I do have my bag that says Mott Haven Art School, and I, I've made that shirt because I want to tell people, like, I... My school was the South Bronx. My school was the artist community that was around me, the, the nonprofit organizations that supported me, uh, the ones that took a chance on a, on a girl who didn't quite know that much but, but had really great ideas and, and allowed me to sort of give me my vision. I found that I found a comfort and, and a lot of, you know, in the art world, you know, the nonprofit is, you know, it's nowhere near the art market, but I don't care. You know, that doesn't bother me. I'm very happy in my nonprofit, you know, community because I do feel more supported, I feel more love, and I feel more connected to the community around me. And and that's what matters. So and, and in the South Bronx we have a lot of amazing nonprofits that are uh, very dedicated to, to keeping the Bronx the Bronx and allowing as much change as and diversity as it 
as it, as it comes in and hoping to, to keep dialogues open with, with lots of the different people that are moving in because it's so different, like the, the, the little groups that are popping up here and now, but I do feel the, the, the love for my, for my nonprofits and you know, it is, a, it is another level of um, uh, you know, grants and, and, and things like that, but I do feel it's, it's very nurturing as an artist to have that, so it's, it's the one that I've, I've thrived in. Thank you. I, I think that it's really important for us to hear your response to that because um, in the moment that we're living in, it is the validity of institutions, for better or for worse, that there's a, there is a call to action around measuring the, the, the usefulness um, from you know, the very highest levels to the most mundane. And um, hearing you all speak to that, I think, is, is really necessary. Uh, we, we have time for one more question? Two minutes? Okay. Two more questions. Two more <laughs> questions. Oh. Uh, well, so just really quickly, uh, you, you all are very ambidextrous when it comes to your use of materials, and there's a heavy sense of materiality that balances out the, the discursive aspect, the process-based aspect to your practice as well. So I just want to hear you speak briefly um, to that. Why the use of many different materials? What function does it serve for your intent? I'll start. Mine's succinct. <laughs> I use, primarily, I use ceramic, I use textiles, I use steel, and I use digital media. These are all pillars of civilization. They were all anchor points in which us as a species moved into the world. So I'm like, okay, let me use those materials to engage um, when uh, my audience isn't the dogs. I wish it was, but the dogs are not interested in what I'm doing. Uh, it's human beings. So I figured I would use these materials as anchor points and how these materials interplay with one another and um, just as a reflection of the human species. Um, well, for me, I just use, it really just comes from the concept. Like in the recent 15 years, I was just obsessed with soil and the way that my process is, is that I don't do one project at a time, because sometimes it takes a whole decade to really just flush it out. And what I do is multiple projects. Um, and I collaborate with other people, like um, recently, right now, we're working with the Black Love Project, which is a project that is part entrepreneurship. So I'm using some of my educational and uh, business sense, and then I'm also, um, and we also, we also are collectively building um, our own kind of institution together with um, previously incarcerated black African American people. So it was something that for me, coming from Detroit, it was such a, a large population of people, family, um, friends that were being swept away um, in you know, the incarceration system and um, the mental health system. And I feel like art is this perfect medicine and it's how like we have like literally have survived like through, not only through song, not only through, but also making things like these crafts, these rituals of even just um, that were in our homes that are kind of erased. And so, um, it was just, so we use that platform as art as a way to um, have um, business owners swap and trade certain things that we could build our own kind of building where um, not only these African American people that didn't have access to um, certain skills that were not offered in their community, whether it be through education or whether it just be skill trade or whether it could just be mural making or photography. This was something like, you know, it could be used and it could be used to generate, not only to just heal, but it also could be used to generate food on the table. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we had to, you know, so the idea was like, okay, 
you just had all of these kind of problems, basically. And through the problems, then that's how the, the project kind of slowly manifested itself. And, you know, things just came together. And people, community, came. they were inspired by the work or something. It was like, I want to be a part of this. And so, you know, they were. Thank you. Melissa. I don't, we don't, we don't have okay. time, is it okay? Okay, um, because we unfortunately have to adjourn, but I, I just want to thank you all so much for sharing your voice and your perspective uh, with us, sharing this time, and thank you also to the audience for, for lending your attention for this brief moment in time. Uh, it's been really great. And thanks to Ahimsa for opening us up for this, this session and setting the tone. Appreciate it. Thank you all so much.